Okay, well, welcome everyone. I'm Suzanne Warnfeldt. I'm part of the outreach team here at the University of Georgia, and I'm joined by my teammates, Omar Harb, uh, Evelina Basinko, and Gloria Geraldo Calderon. We're here to fill you in on the new features and data for release 57 and to demonstrate how to access and interrogate some of that data. You can ask questions as we demo things in your control panel uh, for GoToWebinar. You should have a questions panel. If you type a question in there, we'll try to answer it as soon as possible. And sometimes we can stop for discussion too. So this webinar is being recorded and you'll receive an email tomorrow with a link for the recording, but I want to show you how to get to our webinars page because there's all of our recordings are there. So if you go to any site um, and go to help learn how to use UPath DB and then to the webinars, um, you can find all previous webinars, recordings, and then a list of upcoming recording uh, webinars that will be happening. So all of our component sites uh, look the same. If you happen to be a Cryptosporidium uh, researcher, you'll be at CryptoDB, but, but it'll look exactly the same. It has the same tools and searches. Um, it's just that the underlying data different, uh, is different. And some searches or tools may not be available because the underlying data is, is just that different. So I'd like to begin with an overview of uh, release 57. Uh, and I'll just um, give an overview of the data in tables and then we'll go on to more in-depth demonstrations of the new data and features, you know, by my colleagues um, from specific sites. So uh, release, 57 occurred on the 21st of April. It included 60 new data sets um, across 10 of our different uh, component sites. And the data represented six different data types. So this table shows that some of the sites received more data than others, and that reflects a few things. The number of organisms represented in each site is very different. Um, the availability of study methods for some of these organisms is, um, is also different, like some organisms are easier to study than others. Um, and then some of the research communities here are more um, uh, omics uh, focused, so that would um, change the amount of data available too. But, you know, FunGDB received 23 data sets, VectorBase received 17, Toxa received 5. So everything uh, has been updated well. Uh, there were six different data types integrated, and each of those represents a different biological feature. So we actually integrated 18 different new genomes with annotation that went into four different databases. RNA sequence data is always an incredibly useful omics. Um, uh, data that describes transcript expression, and we had 24 of those uh, data sets, and those went into fungi, plasma, toxo, tritrichy, vector base. Uh, MapView is a tool for mosquito surveillance and population studies that is only available now in vector base, although we're working on getting it into other databases, and, and we integrated eight new data sets. Uh, Matthew data sets into, into vector base this release. We also worked to improve the annotations of several of our genomes on site. We have funding from uh, to manually curate several genomes and our curators added functional information to 15 different genomes. And typically these annotations include changes to a gene product name or go terms and then publications associated with different genes. Apollo is a community annotation platform that we support, and those annotations come from you, our users, and typically uh, represent alternative transcripts or functional updates. Um, those annotations, uh, yeah, when you use Apollo to update a gene, our curators review 
those um, changes and then transfer those annotations to our database. We have two new searches available on our site. Uh, Omar will go over the unannotated intron search. Um, and I'd like to point out though that TriTripDB, TripDB, and HostDB did not receive this new search because of you know, differences in the underlying data. And we also have a data sets gene list search integrated into FunGDB only uh, based on a co-expression analysis um, from this publication here. So how can you use the data that's in uh, release 57? Um, I will turn it over to Omar then who can uh, tell us a little bit more and we'll go more specifically into um, all of our sites. Great, thanks, Suzanne. <clears throat> so I think I have to take control. There we go. Thank you. All right. Hopefully, everybody can see uh, PlasmaDB website. Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Suzanne. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover uh, two things. I'll I'll tell you about new data in uh, PlasmaDB, uh, but before I do that, I'm going to talk to you about one of the new. Uh, searches or functionalities that we added in uh, all of our databases. Uh, and that is a, a tool that allows you to identify uh, potentially new introns, introns that are not part of the annotation. And so that's a very useful tool that allows you to discover uh, new gene models or uh, confirm that your uh, gene model is, um, uh, is correct. Um, I see somebody raised their hand, uh, uh, Parve, I think. Uh, if you have a question, um, it would be great if you can type it in the questions panel or the chat panel, whichever panel you have on your on your window, um, and that would be great. Um, if you really want to speak, let us know, and we'll we'll go ahead and figure out how to unmute you and, and get you to speak. Um, okay, so uh, this new search, as uh, um, Suzanne indicated, our new section includes information for each of our resources about what's new in a particular release, and we also add additional news items uh, depending on um, what is uh, what is going on you know whether we have a, a something specific we want to inform the community we put up a new news item here which often also gets sent out as an email uh, to people who are registered and have chosen to receive emails from us um, and as you can see here uh, there's uh, new data in plasma DB which I will cover in a second but there's this new uh, search available in plasma DB called unannotated intron junctions so I could click here and go to the search directly from the um, from the help uh, from the uh, news section. Um, and I, uh, also, one thing to really highlight is that uh, there are some nice tutorials available, both uh, PDF format and a, uh, a video tutorial, uh, which are quite nice that you can go through and, and do a step by step. And as you can see here, as I'm showing you this tutorial, it's showing you this tool in uh, FungiDB. Uh, we're we're on PlasmaDB, but it really doesn't matter because all, all of our databases are built on the same infrastructure, and so you should be able to find the searches and uh, and uh, run the queries uh, using similar parameters. Uh, you know, you may have to modify things for your specific organisms, but you can learn everything you need to learn about this tool, regardless of which site it is being demoed on. Um, so instead of clicking here on the search, I'm going to back, go back to the home page. And um, there are a couple of ways where you can find searches. One is right here on the left-hand panel. You will notice that there is a, a, lot of, a bunch of categories here and this option to search for. So you come in with a question. I'm interested in searching for genes, for example. Here's a list of his genes. And you open this up and you'll see here there are additional categories. And you may already know that, oh, you know what? Introns will be part of gene models. So that it must be, uh, you know, any intron searches will be part of the gene models, right? And you would be accurate, right? But in most cases, if you're like me, I would be like, oh, I don't know where it would be. So I would probably would want to try and search these searches. And I can filter these searches right up here by starting to type intron, for example. And now you'll get all the searches that are available that ha somewhere have the word intron in them. Uh, or at least in this case, I, I didn't even type the full word. So now when I type the full word, it filters it even fine. And there's only a single search that allows you to identify introns. You can also access all of the searches from the menu bar up here. And the same functionality, the same fil filtering functionalities works as well here. So as you can see, I'm filtering and you see the same search. Okay, and then once you click on this, it takes you to the search page, which allows you then to configure this uh, uh, search and then get results. 
And just quickly to show you that if I go to vector base and I start typing intron here, you'll notice I'll find the same search in vector base. If I go to um, uh, you know ToxoDB or uh, here's ToxoDB, I had it open already, and I go and type intron, you'll find the same thing here. Um, if I go to a database like um, TriTripDB, for example, as Suzanne mentioned, uh, and you type intron, you're going to discover that it is not available here. And and if you're if you're somebody who works on Canada Placida, then you would be you would be not surprised because there are very 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 few introns in Canada Placida, so it won't make sense to uh, for us to allow searches for introns. And the same thing applies to uh, TrickDB. So back to the query in PlasmaDB, I'm going to demo it right here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select the organism that I'm interested in searching, and in this case, I had already pre-selected uh, this Plasmodium falciparum 3D7. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select the minimum number of unique reads that um, that support this intron. So um, anytime we load RNA-seq data set into our database, all the reads from this RNA-seq data set gets mapped back to the genome. And any read that spans a, a potential uh, intron location that has to be split, basically, that becomes evidence for an intron. And we use all of that information um, for uh, driving the search. And so. So you can decide you want to be very stringent. I can say, well, I only want to find um, reads that have at least 5,000, or maybe let's let's be less, less maybe let's say 3,000 <laughs> reads that support um, uh, that support the intron, right? So you're looking for a lot of evidence. So you're looking for good um, uh, introns, basically. And these are introns that are not part of the, annota the, the, the annotation, right? So these will be novel introns, presumably, that are found within genes. Um, you can choose the percent of the most abundant introns. So let's say a, um, a gene has two introns, right? And one of them is, um, is uh, you know, the maximum, let's say one of them has uh, a thousand reads, right? And then you can decide, well, I want my introns that I'm gonna select to at least have 50 to 100% of that thousand reads, right? So you're also adding something to the stringency. I, I pre-selected this to 50 to 100. Um, you could also consider the flanking regions. So if you're interested in looking for introns that are in the five prime or three prime region, the UTRs basically, uh, uh, or maybe the promoters of the of a particular gene. Well, the UTRs in this case, not the promoters, obviously. But uh, so you could do that here, um, and you can mess around with these values. Obviously, at some point you may be getting into the upstream and downstream genes, so you have to consider that as you as you run your search. I'm going to leave it at zero, the defaults. So let's go ahead and run the search. All right, so this returns 255 genes that, that met the criteria that I that I selected. So these are 255 genes that have at least um, uh, that have at least one intron that has uh, over 3,000 reads that support it and are not part of the annotation. And I can I can actually you know sort by the number of introns. And you can see here this one is ribosomal RNA has has a lot. You know, so it really depends on on uh, what you're interested in. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and select one of these genes. So let's take this merozoid surface protein um, 9. And let's go here and look at it. So I clicked on it. I went to the gene page. Um, and, you know, you know, if you're used to our gene pages, you'll see that there's the name of the protein up here, information about its location, um, some shortcuts to, to sections on the gene page. As you scroll down here, you will get this um, section for the gene model. So these are the genes. The blue ones are going from left to right on the gene relative to the to the chromosome they're mapped to. The red ones are going right to left. And in this case, my gene of interest is this merozoid surface protein one, which is a um, uh, going from right to left. Uh, and so if it's going from right to left, uh, you're interested in introns that are directional with the gene, right? Or reads that map directionally with the gene. So as you scroll down here, you'll see that there are, there are a bunch of uh, these are all, this is the uh, RNA evidence introns. Each one of these lines indicates support for a potential uh, intron. I can click on this uh, option here so I can zoom in and scroll on this window. So let's go ahead and scroll a little bit in here. And so, or zoom in, sorry, and let's zoom in some more. So I'm getting closer to this gene. As you'll see here, the annotation says that this gene has no introns, right? Um, and then as you scroll down here, you'll see that there are potentially some really small introns. And so here's one that has 1,814 uh, reads that support it. Uh, if you scroll up here, this one has 4,000, almost close to 5,000 reads that support it. Um, and here's another one that's darker. So the darker the reads, the more evidence, the more um, uh, that support it. 
And as you can take a look at these, you can click on this and get more information about a particular intron and see potentially where the evidence is coming from, which experiment. So you can really delve into these in, in more detail. So, uh, so this is in a nutshell what this query allows you to do. One thing that this is super useful for, obviously, if you're interested in this gene and, and you're trying to clone it and you're interested in finding potential splice variant variants of this gene, you may want to consider these as potential introns. Obviously, this is um, evidence that you would have to uh, investigate further and confirm, um, but this gives you some, some ideas about this. Um, the other thing you can do is, uh, is you can take this information and actually provide community annotation through our uh, Apollo platform. And I've I had one open here before just to save some time. This is an AP2 domain transcription factor. So I ran the search before and I randomly picked this gene, uh, which has this blue intron, which is in the same direction as the gene. Uh, this blue intron has 43,000 reads, right, that's supported. So there's a lot of evidence for, for this intron. Um, and then what I can do is I can actually, uh, in this Apollo platform, and um, uh, I can drag tracks up to the top here, and I can actually work on, on generating a new annotation for this gene model and then submit it. Uh, and that will then appear in our community annotation tracks and will show up on the gene page. I'm not gonna go through these details because we will be covering this in um, a number of, uh, of things coming up in the, in the future, which uh, Gloria will tell us more about in a, in a couple of seconds. Okay, so uh, the next thing I'm gonna cover uh, very quickly before we turn it over, and that is to just uh, discuss quickly a couple of the data sets that we loaded. Uh, so one thing to point out is that we have a number of updated functional annotations for various genomes uh, in PlasmoDB, as you can see here. So if you're interested in Plasmodium falciparum 3D7, you can see here that there were 223 genes that uh, whose, na whose functional annotation was updated, and you'll see here what this includes. And you can go and look at the, the uh, summary of this annotation if you want. It's just a spreadsheet that opens up, and you can see here that there are uh, different tabs for each of these, and you can see what the annotation changes, the cha what the annotation change was for this particular release. Um, and so that's a really nice feature that allows you to keep track and, and see if there's anything uh, new in there that you may be interested in. These annotation changes obviously make it then to our, our uh, official uh, um, names within the database. So that's obviously very good when you're running searches. Um, there were two data sets that we added. There were both RNA-seq data sets. And I'm going to quickly highlight uh, this high-resolution intra-erythrocytic time course uh, transcriptome. This is coming from uh, Zbigniew Bosdek's group in uh, Singapore. And if I go ahead and go to this uh, search um, from the news, it's taking me to this data set page. You will notice all of our data sets have their own data set page, which includes information about the data set, the publication it came from, so the short description about it, uh, and then links to the various searches that you can run against this particular uh, data set. And so for example, you can go in and say, I wanna find genes based on fold change differences. These are all the time points. I'm just gonna randomly select a few time points here. Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. And if I keep it at the defaults, so I'm looking for genes that are up or down regulated um, between these time points. So I'm looking for differentially expressed genes, but I could also change this to say, well, I only find things that are up regulated and then play around with the, with the various parameters. We have a lot of help and information about how to how to um, configure these, but hopefully this graph here on the right will give you some indication of the type of gene that will be returned when you run the search. So this gives you an cue. So basically, I'm looking for genes that are twofold upregulated in the in these red samples that are selected down here compared to the blue samples that are selected up here, basically. And so the difference has to be twofold between the the maximum expressor from the uh, the blue samples and um, and the, the um, uh, maximum from blue samples and the minimum expression from the red samples, basically. Okay, so, um, and then ultimately when you uh, run this search, you will return, um, you'll notice here, this is my previous search up here, and this is my second search here. These are the 387 genes that met the criteria that I was interested in. You will get a gene list of the genes, you'll see the graphs, and you can confirm that, yeah, this, is, this looks like the right uh, profile of expression I was interested in. Um, you can add additional steps and you can say, well, I'm also interested in genes that are that met this criteria, but are also uh, potentially secreted. So I'm gonna look for a search for uh, secretion. And again, not to um, uh, belabor this too much, we have a lot of uh, tutorials and, and uh, YouTubes and uh, uh, hands-on exercises that teach you how to use this. 
And now as I ran the second search for signal peptide, which returned 603 genes, the intersection of these 603 genes with my 387 genes is 59 genes that are secreted and expressed at a particular stage in the, in the, in the parasite. And then you may want to go in and ex explore these uh, further. So I will highlight one more search for, for this data set because it's a, I think it's a pretty cool search that we uh, typically um, uh, we don't have for all data sets because it requires a large number of samples. And so I'm just going to go back to the transcriptomic searches. So instead of going back to the news item, because you can, you can find these data in different ways, so I'm going to go to the RNA sequence evidence experiments. You'll notice here there's a bunch of experiments here. So you would want to find these experiments by, by either doing a search or if it's a new data set in the release, you'll notice that it has um, it has a, a new label here. But up here, I can filter by the author, for example. And so I just started uh, typing the first author's name, uh, uh, Kucharski, and you'll see here the search. These are the different searches that are available. They're described here at the top. And one of them is, is a similarity search, which if I click on this, this allows you to find genes. Um, uh, this allows you to find genes that have a similar expression profile to the, your gene of interest. So for example, I'm just gonna put this, this default gene that's in here. So let's pretend this is a gene that you're really interested in. And you wanna, find, you wanna find other genes that have a similar expression profile. And so I'm gonna keep everything at the, at the default and I'm gonna run the search. And so what this will return um, is any gene that has meets that criteria. And so as you, as you scroll down here, it uh, looks like there's a bug here with these two images, but no matter, this is the same gene itself. So this, um, this graph should be basically identical for, for both of them. But as I scroll down, you will notice here, there's the, my gene is in, in gray right here. And then you'll notice that this gene here has a similar expression profile. It's, it's not the same level of expression, but it has the same sort of trend. It goes up and then goes down again. And then as you go down, you will notice obviously the, the profile distance changes, but uh, you know, you'll hopefully notice that this gets you genes that have a similar expression profile. And then that obviously allows you to then start thinking about potentially genes that have a similar function or acting in the same um, compartment or the same stage and you can start investigating these uh, further. So, so I highly recommend the search for, we don't have it for all of our, our data sets, but if we, um, if we go back to the uh, RNA-seq or even the microarray searches, uh, it's this search that has this little S on it. And so as you scroll down, you can look for, uh, for searches that have, uh, have an S on it. Uh, and so you'll notice that this is the only one for RNA-seq that has that S because it had, it had a, a sufficient number of samples to be able to do the statistics on it. Um, and if you go to our microarray searches, there should be a couple in there as well. So here's one, two that have that have this um, uh, capability. Okay, I think I will uh, stop here and um, let me stop sharing. Obviously, anybody, if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask them and we'll answer them. And I'm going to switch it over to Gloria. And Gloria, hopefully your internet is stable enough. I know you were having... Uh, uh, internet problems this morning so hopefully it'll work for you thank you omar well if at any point i start to break <laughs> please let me know okay <clears throat> okay so you're looking at my vector base screen now yes thank you okay so as omar and susan show you just come to the uh, front page of any of our sites click here on news and tweets and I'm going to look at what we have new for Vectorbase release 57. And the way you notice that we have our release is also here on the top. You, well, from here you cannot see it much, but when, you, when you're in the homepage, you will see the date of the release and the number. So you say, oh yeah, I, I want to see what we have new. And this is what Omar just indicated, the new and annotated intron junction. I just want to point out one thing is that this search currently works differently for parasites and fungi. The difference is that vector-based genomes are normally uh, much bigger. And for two of our species, Anopheles gambiae and Eris aegypti, we have many data sets. So those two things combined, big genomes, many data sets. Uh, so the performance of the query is not that great. So one of the parameters that Omar uh, was showing uh, is not working currently in vector base. So if I type, as he said, the word intron, you will notice 
we only have three parameters, including, of course, the selection of the species. But the last one, which he set by default in zero, which was to see if he wanted to find genes upstream or downstream, is not available in vector base. So hopefully, uh, we will have that uh, soon also available in vector base. I just wanted to clarify that. For the new genomes, here in this list, we have five. But actually, the new ones are the tick ones, uh, one species of Dermacenter, of two of Rupicephalus. Anopheles merus, we already had this genome in a previous release, but we were missing the stable IDs, so now it has it. Culex quinquefaciatus Johannesburg, we already had this uh, assembly, but with the name has been changed. So now it's Johannesburg 2020. So you can differentiate these from the older uh, Culex genome. As for all of our genomes, you can do all the searches and use it in um, all the sites. Notice here that I have my preferences. It has, says 55 of 58. That's because, as I just said, the truly new genomes for us are these three ticks. So right now I have it enabled and I can click uh, disable, which this means is that if you want to run a search or go to a page for the organisms, if you have these enabled, the three ticks are not going to show up. So if you want to include the ticks or just you know, completely change your parameters here in my preference organisms, uh, do it so you can you know, use the ticks uh, data and, and explore. Uh, another change is that we have a community update. So for one of our genomes, Anopheles gambia pest, so for this gene set, we have merges, we have modifications, we have new genes, and we have splits of genes that were one and become two or more. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, it, I invite you to follow our Twitter next week because we are going to be dedicated about what is Apollo and how people actually go about doing these changes. If you are not a social media person, and you come here to the home page just click again news and tweets and just you know come and see what we have so for example here i i just uh we just posted this as next week is bio curation week and we are going to be talking about a poll so we are going to be loading uh gifts and more information to show you how actually uh, you can use apollo uh, to make all these changes and later E, uh, your gene set can be updated. How do you know it has been updated? For example, for Anopheles gambiae, for, we are now in assembly number four and we were using uh, gene set number 13. Now, for the same assembly four, now we move to gene set number 14 uh, because there have been enough changes, actually 378. So we said, okay, now we need to, to change this. And this triggered a whole lot of changes again follow our Twitter uh, to learn more about that. Uh, we have uh, four RNA-seq uh, data sets, which I'm not going to demo today. Uh, and as uh, Suzanne also said, we have a tool called Population Biology, which you can access here from the tools menu. Click on Map View, and we have this worldwide view of data. There is only one thing that I want to clarify that as Susan yet said, yes, most of the data comes from mosquitoes, but this infrastructure can take data from any vector or any article that you are interested. These are the different categories of the data. So available data types are all these. And for example, you can filter and say, I only want to see uh, blood meals, or I only want to see population abundance. So if you click on that, that becomes a filter and you're only going to see that. If you're reading a paper and you find a accession number and say, oh, uh, this is vector-based project and the consecutive number, you can come to our site and type here in the map that ID and you will explore only that data set. And you find a paper, you select the marker and you want to see what is the species distribution before we have these available uh, data types that I was showing early. So this data set is about insecticide resistance phenotypes and genotypes. And I can see all the metadata uh, for the different uh, points. Uh, again, so we are incorporating, we're trying now to incorporate more tick data. Our invitation is always open to receive different data types. Uh, but 
if you have a TIC data set for either a new genome, transcriptome, proteome, or population data, please get in touch uh, with us. And that's all I had to say. Okay, sounds great. Um, I will go ahead and take the Thank screen you. from you. Yes. Um, do you all see ToxoDB? Yes. Okay. Um, so in release 57, we had several RNA seq data sets from experiments that were performed as dual RNA seq. And that means that the researchers harvested host and parasite RNA from the same sample. And then we analyzed those against both the host and the parasite genomes. And I'd like to go over one of those today. Uh, one of those was integrated into ToxoDB, and so I'll go to the news. Um, you can see that we have uh, five different RNA-seq data sets, two that were aligned to Imeria tonella Hutton and three that were aligned to Toxoplasma gondii. But I'd like to concentrate on uh, this first one, which is a dual RNA-seq experiment. Um, so this little description then uh, contains links to the Toxo uh, data set record and to the HostDB data set record. So I'll um, open both of those, right? And the Toxo data set is called Transcriptome of E. Tonella from infected chicken sequel uh, tissues. And the host one is called chicken sequel tissues during E. Tonella infection. So they're definitely related. If I go to the data set for uh, the ToxoDB data set and scroll down to um, the data context and experimental graphs, I see that I have three samples. Now, when I consider the publication and what the full experiment was, for this experiment, um, sequencing was performed on 36 mRNA samples from the Zika of uninfected and E. tonella infected chickens, right? So infected samples were from one, two, three, four, and 10 days post-infection, and six biological replicates for um, each time point were, were collected. So why are we only showing an analysis of three samples here against E. tonella? And the answer is that the uninfected and days one and two uh, just didn't have enough uh, parasite reads in them, right? The uninfected would have zero uh, to warrant analyzing those against the E. tonella genome. If I go to the host DB, which you can sequel tissue during E. tonella infection and, and scroll down to that, I can see that I have the full complement of um, samples analyzed from uninfected to uh, day 10 infected. Okay, so, um, you know, so it's wonderful to explore the data across our sites, and that's what this uh, HostDB is going to offer us, but um, you have to consider also what we're doing. So let's run a few searches and compare. Um, I'm going to go back to Toxo now and do searches for genes based on transcriptomics and RNA-seq. And I will find my experiment. I could use this filter, but I, it, it's right here. I'm going to choose differential expression uh, because the experimental design included six replicates. We're able to calculate all of the statistics, which is a very powerful thing to have. So I'm here at the differential expression search, and I'm going to look for, I'm going to compare day 10 infected uh, samples with day three infected samples looking for upregulated genes uh, with a full change of 10. And we're just going to ramp up those statistics, 0. 0.0001 as a key value. If I could click get answer, I come up with uh, 829 genes, which, which is a lot. And as Omar showed, you know, the value of our uh, search strategy system is that I can combine these results with anything to further, you know, interrogate these results. I can look um, at individual gene pages. They're linked here in this 
did this, I can um, analyze results and do a go enrichment or a metabolic enrichment uh, analysis. Uh, but in the interest of time, I won't um, do any, any of that. What I want to point out is that we can um, run the same query on the same samples in HostDB. So if I go back to HostDB and go to searches, uh, genes, transcriptomics, RNA-seq, I can find this um, chicken sequel tissue during E. tonella infection and look at the differential expression search there and set up the same uh, comparison. I want to use the day three as reference compared to day two, day 10 infected, um, looking for upregulated at tenfold with a good statistics, oh, 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 oops, three zeros and click an answer. Woo! And what I have is 85 genes. Um, so that's really, you know, that's a factor of 10 difference. When we uh, look at the difference between day three infected sequel tissue in, in chickens and day 10 infected sequel tissue in, in chickens, there's only 85 genes that are statistically different. They have very good statistics though, uh, 10 to the minus 67, you know, on down to 10 to the minus two, I imagine. Um, so, but there is not that much going on in the chicken genome at that point. Whereas if I compare that to um, what's going on in the parent site, there seems to be a lot going on. Um, so um, that's what I wanted to point out is that the interplay between um, when we integrate dual RNA-seq data, we can analyze that according um, against the parasite genome and the host genome. And then that gives us, um, you as a user, a little bit more power to um, look at um, what's going on in the host versus the parasite. So I will turn it over to Eve now. All right, uh, thank you very much, Suzanne. So now you should be um, seeing my screen, which is on FongiDB news release page. Um, in this release, we have integrated eight genomes, uh, and that is genome sequence and annotation datasets for various fungi. The genomes were sequenced with ion torrent, PagBio, and or uh, Illumina technologies. And amongst the species represented in this release, we have um, black aspergilli species. We have also pathogens such as candida and um, black yeast uh, Cladiophila fora. And we also integrated Debaryomyces fabrii. Uh, and um, this particular organism was isolated from a mycotic lesion. We also have genomes for Emergomyces africanus, which is a representative of the Emoncia genus that can cause pulmonary diseases known as um, adiospiromycosis. And we um, also integrated other um, genomes such as um, a representative of the Pneumocystis uh, genus and organisms in this group can cause a life-threatening pneumonia in immunocompromised patients. And we also have two um, genomes for the uh, trichophyton dermatophytes. Now, in terms of the unannotated sequences, we have two genomes in this release, and that also includes um, a genome for Epiotrichum montevidesi, and um, this organism causes uh, summer type sensitivity pneumonitis, which is an allergic uh, condition disease that is caused by a repetitive inhalation of um, arthrocanidium. In terms of the functional data sets in FungiDB, we have uh, several interesting um, data sets that uh, we integrated in this release. And um, let's take a look at some of the SNPs, um, SNP data sets that we have. So for um, SNPs, we have loaded six um, different data sets, and they span across Fumi Aspergillus fumigatus, Clavispora, Cryptococcus, Fusarium, and Pneumocystis um, species. 
And for example, for the Aspergillus fumigatus, we have two data sets that include whole genome sequencing data that were collected from um, isolates collected in Spain or were integrated from a um, genomic surveillance study carried out by uh, CDC. We also have um, sequence data, which is a um, clinical um, isolate data for Clavispora and Cryptococcus neoformans. And these were collected um, in different locations from, different, uh, from patients with different diagnosis. And we also have data for uh, plant pathogen Fusarium verticillioides, where we integrated um, uh, strain sequence data for um, a number of strains, and that also applies to Pneumocystis macaque, where we have integrated uh, a total of uh, three different strains collected from different animals. Um, here is example, for example, I will uh, click on the uh, CDC surveillance dataset record page. And here's I, I preloaded um, this in addition uh, ahead of time. And so this is a sort of a standard dataset record page that is attached to every dataset we load, whether it's FongiDB or PlasmoDB. Uh, it will have a pretty much the same um, look. So as you scroll down, you have a chance to learn a little bit more about the data set, but also notice that if you navigate to the very bottom of the page, there is a list of um, searches that are available for this particular data set. For example, you can choose to click on the um, identify genes based on SNP characteristics. And if we click on this link, you will be redirected to a page where you can now set up your custom search. And in this case, for example, you can look at the CDC surveillance data and you may want to choose identify to identify only non-synonymous SNPs. Uh, and in this, this case, I am selecting two parameters, return non-synonymous SNPs, and I want to have at least one SNP in that category or more. And as you deploy uh, the search at the bottom, for, for the demo purposes, I will just leave all of the search criteria default. You will be redirected to first, uh, let's say, your in silico experiment answer for this particular data set. And so we have over 8,000 genes that fit your criteria. And from this point on, you can either look at the data sets to see if the data makes sense. Um, also, you can modify the searches. Um, the search parameters to either make it more stringent or bring in other types um, of data to your search. Now, but coming back to the uh, news and release um, section, I also wanted to uh, quickly touch base on other types of data that we have loaded in this release. And so um, next, I would like to concentrate a little bit on the uh, transcriptomics. And um, so in terms of transcriptomics, we have again uh, six data sets, and uh, these were uh, integrated for Aspergillus, Fusarium, Mucor, Neurospora crasta, and also Pyricularia aresia. For example, uh, we have um, transcriptomics data for Aspergillus nigilans, where authors have looked at the transcriptomic changes that occur within the Canidia or hyphae, which are two different stage growth stages in fungi. We have also data sets for plant pathogens. For example, Fusarium graminearum data set looks at the uh, changes in the transcriptional profile within the pathogen when it infects um, stocks of the corn plants. While the second data set for the Fusarium proliferatum actually looks at the expression of genes um, when uh, the pathogen infects roots of uh, corn plants. In terms of um, the third uh, fungal pathogen, we have a data that was collected um, from the fields in Bangladesh, and Pericularia aresia is the pathogen that causes um, that caused wheat blast outbreak a few years back. And this is the data relates to the isolates that collected one from one of the infected fields. And there are 15 isolates, and you can now investigate their transcriptional uh, profiles within FongiDB. Now, we also have a data set for uh, Mucor, and this is a dual transcriptomic data set. Uh, data set um, similar to what Suzanne have shown you in the past, if we navigate to um, 
the data set record page for um, this particular um, uh, set of data, we um, we link to the dual data sets in um, the respective database. And in this case, the data were collected from the fungal cells and also mouse macrophages. And the, um, the companion data set is located in host DB. And here I quickly navigated uh, and preloaded the page with the host DB records for this data set. And um, when we integrate dual data sets, you can simply now search the expression for example, differences that occur within the pathogen and also within the host cells. And in this case, this is uh, mucor uh, infecting mouse macrophages. Now I'll come back to the release uh, in new section again. And um, we'll tell you just a, a, a few um, more things about other data sets. So we also have ChIP-seq. Uh, where authors have um, looked at um, the wild type Canidia while trying to map the genome-wide occupancy of um, elongating RNA-seq to polymerase. And this dataset is available as tracks within the JBrowse. We have also have a new data set and a new search. Suzanne have mentioned in the past that we have developed a search that is called Dataset Gene List. And uh, in this release, we have applied this search to um, a data set in FongiDB. So Calcium dataset um, is a Candida co-expression network analysis data set. And um, the RNA-C core expression data was loaded in the previous release. And um, this particular RNA-seq data was constructed from um, 853 RNA-seq runs from a total of 18 large-scale Canda Elbicans expression studies. And within uh, this release, we have developed a new search that actually returns gene lists by taking in core expression network analysis. So what does this mean? So I will navigate to the dataset record page. So this means that we have a data set where we have integrated a list of genes. These genes are predicted based on the UMAP and um, other statistical analysis that was performed by the Teresa, Teresa and uh, Matthew Omeara. And they have identified uh, conserved 18 clusters of core expressed genes. And now you can search these genes within the new search that we have developed. And again, I am on the dataset record page. So if, if I scroll down, I'll be able to identify the link that will lead me to this particular search. So now that we are on the search interface, I have an ability to uh, essentially make the uh, selection and customize my search. So there are 18 clusters. You may want to choose any of these if you're interested, for example, in cellular localization. But in this particular example, I'll just want to identify any genes that co-express uh, across the 18 large-scale datasets in Canada, and they're all fall within the category of translation. And you can read, by the way, by the way, you can read more about the specific uh, methods used to generate this data in their paper, which is also linked within the dataset record page. But if I click on the Get Answer and deploy my search, I will be um, redirected to um, a page, and I'll preload it here that um, has uh, sort of um, a, a first step that is gen that is essentially a collection of genes that are within that particular cluster. Now from this point on, so notice that you have 250 genes for Canda albicans, and um, there are several things that you may want to do with this list. You can examine the different types of the um, genes that are clustered when within this um, particular uh, group of genes, you can export any um, underlying or annotated data that we have loaded in FungiDB, or you can also add a step and combine this data with different types of data within FungiDB. For example, it could be an RNA-seq dataset. And one way to deploy this is use the search to quickly navigate to the RNA-seq. And so notice that we have a number 
of uh, candidate data sets available. So you may want to um, combine your search results with another interesting data set, such as those where people have looked at the transcriptomics of this pathogen within, um, let's say, uh, transcriptomics of the pathogen um, within the fungi and also its host. Or you can choose other types of data and notice that you can transform this data set record, um, uh, this gene list, and gene list into other uh, types of data, or even bring in, let's say, um, various SNPs from uh, the SNP data sets integrated into FungiDB, or co locate your um, data, let's say, with the SNP sequences or genomic segments. Now, and finally, just the last um, a minute or two before I will turn it over to Suzanne, I want to touch base on the phenotypic and updated functional annotation. So in this release, we have uh, updated and re refreshed links to Phi-based database, which is um, a database that uh, curates uh, host and fungal phenotypes. And uh, these phenotypes are specific to pathogen interaction. And um, in addition to updating our records that brought in new data from Phibase, we have also updated um, annotation for several species in FungiDB. And that includes um, two Aspergillus genomes, Fumigatus and Nigellans, and also Parvicular aresia, which is a plant uh, pathogen. And all of the data is summarized via the uh, link within the news page, where you can click on the summary, and you can also click on the tabs on the bottom to further look at the type of the changes that have occurred. And um, just as a quick reminder, any and all changes that are reported here are now integrated in FindGDB, so they will be available through the searches that you create within the database. And um, I think that is it on my end. So Susan, I will pass it on back to you. Well, okay, thanks, Eve. Um, so that, you know, concludes our overview of the of the new data and features. I think we had a great release and a kind of proud of it, but I was wondering if there are any questions. If there are none, um, we can wrap up a little bit early, or we can go on to demo some other things if anybody is interested. Yeah, sounds good. We could give people a few seconds if they want to type a question. And otherwise, I agree with you. I think uh, people will be happy to have an extra two minutes before the next meeting. <laughs> And if I could just mention really quickly to everyone, if you would like to see any additional data sets um, in Fungi or any other ViewPathDB database, please feel free to send us email. Uh, you can contact us via the contact us link at the top of each site, each genomic site. Or we also have a section um, under about and how to submit data to us where you can um, fill in the various forms for different types of data. But we always happy to receive nominations of data sets from you, the community, the experts on um, on the various fields of science. Okay. Thanks for that. Yeah, all right. Sounds good. I think we can um, we can go ahead and log off. Thanks for spending. Thanks. You know, Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.